You can go. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, please welcome Violet Blue. Thank you so much for having me here to speak. It's, it means more than I can say. Um, so I'm here to talk about sex and drugs, um, but I also want to say a few words first about what happened last time I went to talk about sex and drugs. Uh, as a lot of you know, I gave this talk at B Sides last year, here in 2012, and um, and it was great. I had a wonderful time. Um, the only thing that's different this year is that this year I remembered my slides. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then I was asked to speak again at Eastside San Francisco this year in February. And um, I get asked to speak quite a bit these days, which is really wonderful. Um, talking about sex and technology has come a long way. I've been talking about sex and technology for almost a decade. And that was pretty sobering when I realized that from this talk together. Um, it's just been something I've been doing at conferences all over the world. Um, ever since I've been able to just get onto a tech stage somewhere um, to talk about sex and technology, sex and gender, how sexuality affects technology in communities that use technology, especially at-risk communities. And I've ended up speaking pretty much everywhere. The only place, I think, one of the only places I haven't spoken is a TED Talk, but I don't really care about TED Talks. <laughs> <laughs> I've also given two Google Tech Talks on sex and tech, and one was about privacy and sex, and that was really fun. Um, so I'm, I'm used to getting up and talking about sex and technology. I'm used to controversy being around the types of talks that I give. Um, but my talks are always very inclusive, and I always tell the audience what we're going to talk about before we talk. Um, I've only had one organizer get nervous at the last minute, but my talk didn't get canceled. The talk just didn't get introduced in the proper way. Um, and I also, in my other, other time, besides some of you know me as a tech journalist, some of you know me as a sex writer, I write um, sex ed books, and I write nonfiction sex columns and things like that. Um, and I'm also a sex educator, which is something I've been doing since 1999, actually. Like, they're putting all these dates together, it's like, whoa. Um, and what that means, saying that I'm a sex educator, doesn't mean that I've read a couple of books and decided I was going to go write a poem about, you know, how everyone should be having sex. It means that I've done lots and lots of trainings. I've done about 160 hours of trainings, and I have probably around 10 years of face-to-face, peer-to-peer counseling. Um, I work sex crisis hotlines. I teach other educators how to teach about sex, and I work at one of the places that I love to teach that I've been teaching at for a very, very long time is a place called San Francisco Sex Information. And that's a place where we have sex crisis hotlines that are regular phones and also um, you know, people can email us, or they can send us letters and things like that. But um, this is a place that's been around for a couple of decades, and the trainers there are doctors, MFTs, nurses, uh, people who are professionals in a variety of different healthcare fields and outreach fields as well. So people who do needle exchange and things like that. And um, and this talk, the sex and drugs talk, is an adaptation of a talk that we give when we teach other educators. And what I mean by teaching other educators is we. We teach nurses, we teach people that work at Planned Parenthood, we teach people who have gone through the system of learning how to give health care to their clients, but haven't gotten a well-rounded approach to talking about sexuality with their clients. And the thing is, is that sexuality is all these different things that they don't end up learning when they go through all of the usual channels of school, whether it's in for psychology or you know, regular uh, MFT or MD or RN, and you know, they they probably get upwards of about eight hours of sex education unless they're focusing on reproduction. So what we do is we fill in a whole lot of blanks which have to do with sex and gender, um, pornography, sex work, um, even, even sex crises when people get things stuck in them, you know, just a variety of different things, talking about different orientations and different fetishes and permutations in a very non-clinical way but also a matter of fact and non-judgmental way. And so, this is, this is my background and my history with this. Um, my talks are always not technical, and I make that really clear up front. Uh, my talks are about issues that affect the communities that I'm talking to. So, I was gonna give this talk at B-Sides in San Francisco this last year, and this isn't something that I wanna, I wanna drag out to talk about, because it really, it's really actually upsetting for me to talk about what happened, but I wanna kinda get you up to speed in case you're not familiar with the story. 
Um, so I was getting ready to give my talk, and unknown to me, my talk had actually been targeted by a feminist organization uh, called the AID Initiative, which I actually, honestly, and I apologize, but I hadn't heard about them until that day of my talk. And um, I found out after my talk was, I actually voluntarily pulled my talk. Um, and the reason I did was because I, I got to the venue and the organizer came up to me and presented me with a dilemma in which he was being pressured by this organization to remove my talk and had been threatened and had been cajoled and pushed around. And I found out that this had been happening in emails for a while and prior to me giving my talk, no one had told me that any of this was going on. And the reason that they hadn't told me was because um, the person from the AIDA initiative had expressly told them that they didn't want to talk to me. Um, they didn't want to talk to me about my talk. They didn't want to have any contact with me. Um, they absolutely flat out refused to speak to me in any way whatsoever and did not want to be identified to me in any way whatsoever. Um, so the organizer presented me with a dilemma in which he was being pressured and threatened with problems if he didn't have my talk pulled. Um, because of the, I, I walked in and, and I was talking to him and he was like, so I've got this problem. Um, how much rape is in your talk? And I was like, how much what is in my talk? And, and he was like, well, someone's here and they're, they're really concerned that you're gonna talk about anything having to do with rape. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm being told that there's gonna be problems if this talk is allowed to continue. And I was like, this is, this is crazy. Like, my talk isn't about rape. Of course, there are drugs that I talk about that can be used in that manner. Um, but that's not what the talk is about. And so, understanding that he was in a difficult position, I volunteer, but voluntarily pulled the talk. Um, the talk itself is really a harm reduction talk about drugs and sex. And if you know, you read the description, you would have understood that that it was you know here here are things that people like to do, and here are things that can go wrong, and here here's why people like to do these things, and so here's how to do this safely if you decide to do that. Harm reduction is something I've been teaching for a very, very, very long time. And the principle of harm reduction, which is in my slides in a minute, but the principle of harm reduction is that it comes from a perspective of acknowledging that people are going to do dangerous or unsafe things. And rather than just saying no, which, as we know from history here in the United States, the just say no approach to drugs has been a disaster and does not work. Um, that approach, rather than taking that black and white approach, is acknowledging that people are going to engage in these activities um, and knowing that they're going to do so, not telling them whether it's right or wrong, not prescribing their behavior, but describing their behavior to them and describing the effects of these behaviors so that they can make the decisions that are best for them and the communities and the people, the loved ones that they will be affecting by their actions and their choices. And it's pretty, it's, it's pretty basic, but a lot of people not a lot of people, a lot of conservatives really don't like this methodology of dealing with things like drugs and sex because a lot of them come from the perspective of if you talk about it in a way that isn't telling someone not to do it, that you're essentially say, you're suggesting that they should go and do this activity. Um, and it is, it's along the lines of the idea of giving people information is the same as telling them to go do it, um, which is something that hackers deal with a lot. Um, where information, you're simply giving information, and information is being like confused with telling people to go do stuff. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's the scope of the talk. And the talk is about physical safety, it's about emotional safety, intellectual safety. And so I was really surprised to hear that this, this was the reaction, and I was really deeply surprised to find out that this had been a campaign for a while to try to get this talk derailed. Um, it really bothered me because they didn't know the contents of the talk. And, but you could easily see the contents of my other talks. Um, so after I was polled, I wrote one blog post. And I wrote one blog post that's on my Tumblr that described what happened. It was a very matter-of-fact post. And that was pretty much it. That was about all I said about it. I mean, other than face-to-face -face with friends and colleagues and things like that, I just did the one post to let people know what had happened to me um, and what had happened to my talk. Because a lot of people had come to see the talk. I found out later that the AI Initiative had brought a, a magazine, they brought a reporter and photographer from Marie Claire to the day that my talk was being given. And that this act of getting a talk told was essentially a big publicity stunt that this organization was doing in order to further the agenda of their, of their outreach and to end 
the mission of the magazine. And this was really, really disturbing to me. Um, as I was finding this out and finding out that it was going to be coming out in the June issue of Marie Claire, a couple of other uh, articles started appearing online. And the articles were essentially from the Ada Initiative to whichever journalist or writer they were talking to. I was never contacted by any of the people who wrote these pieces. Um, and the pieces went up and essentially painted and portrayed my talk as a pro-rape talk um, and suggested that I was teaching hackers how to rape and that this was a welcome thing in this community. And it was absolutely sickening. It was, it was revolting. And I got really kind of depressed because it's so not what I do and it's so not who we are. Um, and eventually, when the Marie Claire article started to come out, Marie Claire um, wrote the title of my talk wrong. And I don't know where that miscommunication came from. The only instance of my talk title being the title that they used is their use of the title, where they took out the, you know, plus sign, the plus minus sign, which was, you know, it was supposed to be sex plus and plus minus drugs. Um, and they just said that it was sex drugs. Like it's, it's a, a pro rate, a rate of talk. And I was like, what is going on here? So I had this really bizarre sort of smear campaign happening about me in the talk. And what really bothered me more than anything was the way that hacker culture was portrayed. Um, especially in the Marie Claire magazine. Um, it was all these glossy color photos, it was a five page article, a five page spread, and it essentially painted hacker culture as a culture that's predominantly male, um, a culture that turns a blind eye or encourages, encourages sexism, encourages assault, um, encourages women as targets, and that the women, the few women that are in hacker culture are victims that sort of need to be saved. And this, this is a completely twisted view of the hacker culture that I know and experience, especially that I travel to so many hacker conferences and I write about them and I, and I speak occasionally at them. Um, it just painted hacker culture as a very vicious place and even called hacker cons like tail for geeks, which was just completely offensive and completely wrong. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that we have some damage to route around. And I think that me being asked to come and give this talk here is part of undoing some of the damage that's been done here. And I wanna kinda of talk a little bit about the damage because the mission of the ADA Initiative, which I, I wanna read it to you because it's, a number of hacker conferences have adopted the, the code of conduct that this organization has written. And I believe that their stated values are something that we all share in many ways. Um, it says, the Ada Initiative supports women in open tech and culture through activities like producing codes of conduct, anti-harassment policies, advocating for gender diversity, training allies, and hosting Ada Camp conferences. Sounds great, right? This would be great if it was practiced. According to the Ada Initiative, in any context, talking about sex and sexuality is unacceptable in any of these instances, community instances, professional instances, or the intersection of both. And especially talking about sex is inappropriate when there are women in the room. And that's, that's the line. <laughs> right. So it's, I mean, when gender's your shtick, it's pretty convenient to remove the very people that talk about their experience from the conversation, right? So, and also, I mean, it, it affords a very offensive notion that women need to be saved or pulled away or you know, protected somehow from these difficult and taboo and challenging topics um, and somehow couldn't hold our own. So, they have managed to get their anti-harassment, anti-sex anti policy into about 55 conferences. Um, and they have some pretty high-name conferences listed on it, which is why I think it's important that we have this discussion about, about the damage and the potential damage seen writ large in what happened with the hacker communities in this organization. Um, their they, you know, anti-harassment policy is at Google I.O. Um, it's at, where is it? It's Wikimedia Foundation, Linux Foundation, and the Python Software Foundation. Um, so really quickly too, I should talk about the reactions to what happened after my talk was pulled. I got a lot of support from the hacker communities at large, and I just, again, I can't say how much it means. Um, after a decade over a decade of doing this work and doing all this outreach and talking about all these things and putting up a lot of shit for it, having so many people go to bat for me meant more than I can ever express. Um, 
one of the biggest and loudest reactions to what happened, but was done so very elegantly, was from Brucon, which is uh, it's the Belgian Hacker Conference. It's September 26th and 27th. Be there. Um, and they wrote this statement. As our anti-harassment policy was based on a sample policy supported by the organization that, in our opinion, has acted against those exact values we try to encourage, we do not feel that we can give the impression to support those actions. It is therefore that we are currently working to rewrite our policy from scratch. This will be done with help and support from community members of all genders, familiar with the matter and familiar with Brucon values. So instead, what they decided to do was take out the policy and ask their community, how do, how do we do this? How do you want to do this? Um, what's, what's going to be meaningful for you and what's going to work for everybody? And I think that, that is, that's the template that I want to start to begin to encourage here because essentially, I think that if Ada Initiative really wanted to solve the problems that they're saying they want to address, or any organization that wanted to talk about gender issues or sexism in technology, I think that the first step is asking you what the issues are and asking you what goes on here and what you feel that you might need or get suggestions or find out talking to the organizers, talking to security, finding out what the rate of incidences are, talk, and finding out what the community needs and what the community feels is missing and then working toward building something that meets the needs of the community rather than coming in from the outside and applying issues to a community. It just doesn't make any sense. So, so okay, so what, what's the damage here? Um, what is, what's the damage that we need to wrap around? Right now, we have had a really super high profile piece go out that has reached millions of readers, millions of viewers online, um, that paints hacker culture in this very, very negative light. Um, and there are negative lights that hacker culture doesn't mind being painted in, that's for sure. Um, but this one is particularly inaccurate. Um, it doesn't illustrate who we are, it doesn't illustrate how we treat each other, and it doesn't illustrate in any way accurately how we learn and gather information. And that is particularly upsetting to me. Um, we also have an example of a woman stepping on another woman to get ahead. And I think that this is something that, outside of hacker culture, I, it happens a lot, especially in the workplace. And this is a topic for a, a whole other talk, but I think it's an important topic to bring up, and I think that it's something that we don't want in our communities. Um, yeah. So when you think about it, you know, when you think about the pieces, and you know, they, they circled in, you know, the dongle gate issue, and they brought those red, the fucking creeper cards into the conversation as well. Um, oh, great. <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. Um, it, none of it makes a convincing sell for women in tech. None of it makes a convincing argument for bringing women into technology at all. I don't, I don't even understand. It, it's, this wasn't thought through at all. So none of this also encourages any free and open discussion of anything, of any, any taboo topics, any, any difficult and challenging topics. Um, and, and when you think about the gravity of this, you just think there's got to be a better way. And I have a few ideas of what those better ways are. And you'll have to pardon me for reading the notes because it's, it's, it's really important to me. I've been working on this for a while. So the extremist feminists that, you know, Ada Initiative and, yeah, I'm a writer. <laughs> um, and I, again, I'm going to use as an example the red cards and the creeper cards. And I'll, I'll explain why in a second. It, there's, these are not solutions oriented approaches to the problems that they're suggesting. The reason that I'm, I'm not a fan of the red card to the creeper cards is that they're essentially an anti-harm reduction approach to dealing with the situation. Um, what they do is they blame and shame individuals and they attack individuals rather than dealing with the behavior. Because the problem is the behavior, it's not the people. And so it's, it's, it's blaming and shaming. And I think that the last thing that hackers need is to be isolated and shamed any further about anything. So I, I just, I'm calling bullshit on the right cards. <laughs> so taking the idea of the red cards, what's a solution to that? 
What's the solution to that? How about we write and publish something that talks about how not to be creepy? I mean, why don't we describe what creepy behavior is so that we can even apply it to ourselves, right? And make sure that we're not doing it. So taking that and extrapolating it a little bit, what is creepy behavior? Creepy behavior is, well, it's someone who willfully pushes another person's boundaries. Someone who pushes boundaries that are stated. Someone that transgresses boundaries. And this happens without knowledge sometimes. And so we need to give people an out to understand you know, what constitutes boundary crossing and what constitutes checking in with people and being able to read other people's boundaries. And then on the flip side of that, why don't we also write and publish and make public something that talks to people and tells them how to deal with creepy behavior. So rather than going, you're a dick, I'm gonna punch you, you're a bad person, you know, why don't we why don't we come up with some more productive solutions so that people who aren't intending to be creepy, which is what's happening most of the time, um, are, don't end up in a position where they're defensive and shamed and they don't know what they did wrong and they, they're not sure what happened. Um, so please steal these ideas, by the way. Um, how about we publish primers on diffusing conflict? Wouldn't that be helpful in hackerspaces? <laughs> right? <laughs> Why don't we publish a primer on bystander intervention? Bystander intervention being seeing someone that you're wondering if is at risk and learning productive ways to intervene, learning productive ways and ways that are effective to diffuse a situation that may be harmful for someone. Um, and also a primer on target, non-target status would be really, really nice as well. Understanding what the difference is when someone is living in sort of a targeted world or targeted environment, such as being female, um, where you live in a world and you, you know, most of the time, especially you know, in the outside world, you're dealing with people who are assessing you on a value or non-value scale and having to cope with that and having to work around that constantly. I think that these things would be really helpful and I think that these would be really protective solutions to these problems. Um, if you know, indeed they are problems, and it is really up to you, the hacker communities, to determine if this is something that you want. So, I think another thing that would be really, really great to do would be to talk about the effects of drugs and alcohol <laughs> on sexuality and on people in general. Um, and, you know, I mean, the number one date rape threat in the world is alcohol. Think about it. In talking about drugs and sex, we can also talk about things like informed consent. And we can talk about things like, you know, moderation. All these things that have somehow gotten skipped over in this other conversation, this other, this other insertion of values into a space that I think is, you know, hacker culture is, is not young, but figuring these things out is still in a very young stage. So I think that we can take this as an opportunity to do something really exciting. And I'm gonna dismiss the idea right up front that, oh, it's a good thing those cards were made, or oh, it's a good thing the initiative did what they did because it got the conversation started. I think that's bullshit. What we're doing is we're routing around damage. This conversation was already happening in many ways. The fact that I was giving this talk at Eastside last year means that we're already having this conversation. You know? So, anyway, so I'm gonna talk about sex and drugs, but I need to, do something here really quick. Can we, how would you like me to do this? Oh, good. Switch back to my, oh, switch to my feet. Switch to my clock. And now you're not up. Okay, thanks. But I don't have to rethink anything, so. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. I'm good. Yeah. It's getting changed in the next. Oh, yeah. You're good. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So, let's get to the fun talk. So I'm here to, to talk about sex and drugs. Um, yes, <laughs> now we have the good stuff. So, like I said, this sex and drugs talk comes from um, a, a history of giving a talk very similar to this. This talk has been adapted and it's been changed for this audience. And one of the ways in which it's been adapted is that I've taken out some of the other more clinical drugs and I've taken out the discussion of hormones and I've taken out talk of specifically drugs that are for sex, such as Viagra and things like that. And the reason that I did that was A, 
to trim the time a little bit, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about those topics and, and those drugs later. Um, but I wanted to talk about drugs that are specifically used recreationally and in recreational contexts, because that's that's more appropriate for the discussion here. Um, and the way I'm going to begin the talk is we're going to talk about the system functions, sexual system functions, just to like, you guys probably already know a lot of this stuff. There's probably some stuff you don't know. Um, but it also kind of, once you understand a lot of the system functions, you really start to understand what the effects of drugs and alcohol are on the system. And I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. And the way that I'm going to talk about the drugs themselves is sort of an up, down, horny thing. So it's, here are the drugs, here's what the drug is, here's why people do these drugs, which again, like I said, is a very controversial way to talk about the drugs because I'm not going to be like, these drugs are awful. I'm going to be like, people do these drugs because they're fun. Okay? People do these drugs because they like to do it. People have sex because it's fun, hopefully. Um, people seek sex because it's pleasurable. And so, like I said, that's a very different way of approaching this. It's from a harm reduction perspective. Again, here's harm reduction as well. And you see at the bottom, in parentheses, this talk is actually unchanged from last year. The argument is that information or education is the same as advocacy, is the exact reason that my talk was pulled from San Francisco B-Sides. So it was especially, especially painful for me to have an anti-harm reduction approach have my talk pulled. Um, so as some of you may know, harm reduction is practiced in a number of different countries around sex and drugs. One great example is the way that it's done in Holland, um, where they have basically legalized a lot of the, the practices that are illegal in this country in regard to sex and drugs. And by doing so, what they've been able to do is they've been able to to regulate the use of these things, they've been able to make safe spaces for these activities to occur. So what they've done is they've reduced the risks to the individuals, reduced the risk to the community by providing places like safe shooting zones and for, for heroin and needle exchange so that people can get clean syringes and not be spreading hepatitis and HIV as much as they would. Um, and also sex work as well, which is very dangerous when it's criminalized. So it's, it's had a lot of really, really good impacts in a lot of different places. That's something that unfortunately will never happen in this country, at least probably not in our lifetimes, but we can at least practice these things in a way that works as individuals and in our community so that we can keep our communities safer and healthier in the long run. So how I talk about sex is, it's, it's from the school of sex positive education that I come from, and what does sex positive mean? Sex positive is essentially a way of talking about sex and sexuality that is non-judgmental. It, stress, it stresses accurate information, um, and by being non-judgmental, it means that it is not prescriptive, it's not telling people what to do, it is just telling people how things are done and describing things to people. Um, sex positive does not mean anything goes. One of the nice things about sex positivity is that in the larger conversation, sex positivity also accepts and acknowledges the need for boundaries. So there's a there's sort of a, a, a misnomer about sex positivity where it's like, oh, it's everything, and it's, you know, wow, it's everyone running wild. But no, it's actually about understanding boundaries and understanding negotiation and, and understanding that that is part of having like a really hot sex life. So I use words like so many and most. And the reason for that is that Words like all and everyone and all the time are actually inaccurate when it comes to sex. And also these, these ideas can be very harmful ideas to introduce when talking to, like say, our clients on the phones. Oh, everyone has an orgasm that way. I mean, can you imagine the shame that, or embarrassment or, or how broken someone feels when, when they hear that, if that's not working for them? So we've, we've thrown that out, and we use words like some, many, and most because this makes sense. Some people orgasm that way. Many people find that when they orgasm that way, this happens. Things like that. Um, also, the perspective I come from is that gender is not binary, and this is also another controversial approach. Um, I will, for the talk, use standard pronouns for the sake of familiarity, um, but I don't come from a school that believes that gender is binary. And also, orientation isn't a, a binary thing either, so if not straight, does not equal gay, necessarily. So, just so you know, this is one system. You may have seen this system before. This is, this is a, it's, it's, you know, in sex ed, it's so crazy because, like, all we have are these 
what we've been doing, like with the sex education we've been doing at SPC for so long, is that we've essentially been teaching a pleasure-centric approach to sex, which is completely at odds with the rest of what we get, at least in the United States, which is a reproductive approach to sex. So everything that we have in terms of slides and diagrams and things like that are are reproductive, and they don't. So all the pleasure anatomy is left almost out of this image. And and I, I actually wanted to show you this for a reason because then I can I can put the links for you, so it's really really fun. Um, so this, as you know, is the female reproductive system, but there's also a pleasure system in here. And I'm just going to go with the point. That's kind of where the clitoris is. This is the pubic bone, labia. This is, they don't even have it. Oh yeah, here's the urethra right here. So what's missing is this that goes from the bladder to the urethra, that's where urine leaves the body. That would be really nice to see, don't you think? Um, but this is, this is where the, the famed, famed G-spot is, actually. Um, it is the erectile tissue that surrounds the area that urine leaves the body, the urethra. And it's also packed with glands that respond pleasurably to stimulation in many cases when a person is aroused. And also what's missing from this diagram is all of the erectile tissue that essentially fills a lot of these areas. And I'll tell you why that's important, but let me show you where it is because it's not on here. The clitoris is actually a wishbone shape and it goes past the opening of the vagina and meets just at the end of the vagina. Like again, I said it's a wishbone. It goes all the way back to the perineum here. And this entire area, this entire area is filled with erectile tissue. This erectile tissue is analogous to the erectile <coughs> tissue that is in the penis. So what happens when a woman is aroused, aroused, is that these tissues fill with blood and they engorge and they swell. The swelling may be noticeable, it may not be noticeable. Um, part of what happens with that swelling is the swelling um, it's the erectile tissue also surrounds uh, quite a bit of the barrel of the vagina, and it presses uh, blood up against the walls of the vagina, which comes through as a clear fluid, and that's what creates vaginal lubrication. Oh, laser pointer, cool. Are there any cats here? <laughs>
a hint of coffee, <laughs> have a cigarette, and bear down for a while before you go to the ER. So this is the other system that we're talking about today. And you're probably familiar with this system as well. Again, this is not, this doesn't have everything in it. Um, and also, again, at rest, the anus is not a big cavern that you can toss things into. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, the bulb of the penis actually goes quite far back and sometimes goes behind the prostate. Um, and all of that, at, um, the bulb of the penis and all the way down to the tip of the penis, the glands, um, is erectile tissue as well. So again, it's analogous. And this fills with blood, a healthy cardiovascular system is needed for this thing to function properly. Same thing goes with the anus, it's smooth muscle, it's not under control. Um, and a lot of lubricant is required in order to use this thing pleasurably. Um, <coughs> And what else did I want to say? Oh, smooth muscle, yes. So also smooth muscle is uh, parts of the penis are smooth muscle. And so what this means also is why you can do as many bench presses with your dick as you want to, you will never be able to bulk this thing up. So all those things that tell you you can enlarge your penis are actually bullshit. Drugs can have side effects. And that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about I have them in nice little categories for you, actually. Um, and the thing about drugs is that, what, before I start getting into some of the descriptions I'm going to talk about, some of these things may be, may be jarring for some people, they may be upsetting for some people, so I want to put this out there now. If you want to take a break from the talk, feel free to. Um, if you feel uncomfortable at any time, definitely feel free to take a walk. Um, it's totally okay to disagree with me. It's totally okay to disagree with the practices that people do. Um, what it's not okay to do during my talks is blame or shame anyone or blame or shame yourselves. Um, also, the thing is that people are going to be, I'm going to be talking about people using drugs and, and practicing sex acts that may be at odds with who you are, how you feel is right. And we're just going to, we're just going to talk about it. We're going to have questions afterward, which, by the way, is not going to be a personal share time. So, no, no, no. Yes. Check your judgments is all I'm trying to tell you. So check your judgments about drugs. Check your judgments about what's good sex, what's bad sex, what are good drugs, and what are bad drugs. And um, I think that you know, you'll find that you'll, you'll learn some interesting stuff, that's for sure. So um, not everyone responds to drugs in the same way. Um, people respond in a variety of different ways, which is why I'm going to be talking about a lot of these things on a scale. Um, I'm going to start with stimulants, which, as many of you know, shut off shyness and turn up your nervous system. Um, stopping the use of stimulants can cause depression, and it can also cause a drop in your libido. Um, we're going to talk about these drugs. So. Let's talk about meth. <laughs> What's great about meth? Um, <laughs> why do people like it? Why do people do meth? Well, um, it makes you alert. Um, it is a euphoric. It is an appetite suppressant. Um, it contributes to weight loss. But it also gives you a feeling of invincibility. So again, it's really good at shutting off shyness. What's bad about meth? Well, <laughs> psychosis, crack bugs, um, hallucinations, compulsive behavior, paranoia, paranoia, and suicidal ideation. These are all side effects of meth. But what does what happens with sex and meth? People are going to do meth, and people are going to have sex. Um, some people are going to use meth to attempt to heighten sex. Um, the thing is about meth is that erections can be very difficult to get when you're on meth, um, and then once you get them, <coughs> they're very difficult to make go away. It is very very difficult to have an orgasm on meth. So what that's called is orgasmic inhibition. And what it does is it, it makes it very impossible to reach the summit. Um, however, once you do reach the summit, it can intensify orgasm, which is why some people want to do this. Um, it can delay orgasm, which for some people is, is a helpful thing. Um, the problem with that, however, as well, is that it can make sex last too long. And by too long, I mean you can get dry, or you can be having sex and not realizing that you're actually damaging yourself or damaging your skin or needing to use more lube or hurting your partner or other things. So that's what I mean by too long. Um, the condition of getting an erection that won't go away is globally called crystal death. Um, it also causes something called retarded ejaculation, which is easy, which is when uh, an, uh, 
male goes to have an orgasm, and instead of the ejaculate coming out, the ejaculate is retained and often goes up into the bladder, which it is then absorbed into the body. Um, but that is that can be very frustrating for some people. Um, it's highly impacted in STD and STI transmission, and that's because there's a lot of risk taking associated with men, and that risk taking also has to do with having sex. Um, it's it's a, it's a good poor impulse control drug. Coke is very similar. Coke blocks the reuptake of dopamine. And so this explains a lot of why Coke addicts are crazy moody. Um, what's great about Coke? Well, euphoria, alertness, energy, and what some of my colleagues like to call the illusion of competency. <laughs> so true. Um, what's bad about Coke, um, besides hanging out with Coke heads most of the time, um, anxiety, paranoia, and restlessness are the main, main bad things about it, um, besides the, all the other things that go with doing amphetamine-style powder drugs. Um, before sex, Coke can be fun. This is what they say. Um, users feel sexier, they feel powerful, they feel confident, their shyness is decreased. Again, the illusion of competency. <laughs> um, and then there is the colloquial term, which is very similar to the other one, called Coke Dick, which is very, very similar to Crystal Dick, where if you can get an erection, from women, if you can get aroused, it, with women it goes away, it contributes to dryness in women, but with men, you can get an erection, and it doesn't go away, and you can't have an orgasm, and that's very, very frustrating. Um, a, a sexual use for cocaine is as a topical anesthetic. This is not a good idea. <laughs> The reason it's not a good idea is because it is a numbing agent. And so some people have the idea that using it as a numbing agent will help make them last longer, will decrease their sensitivity, and this may be true. However, what it does is it, it makes it so you are actually numb, so you can't feel the skin, your own skin, therefore you can damage the skin. But it also numbs your partner. And that means that you and your partner may not know that you need more lubrication for safety. You may need to stop or slow down. and Without enough lubrication, when things are going in and out of each other, there can be tears, um, there can be abrasions, and this can increase the likelihood of transmission of viruses and infections as well. So you can kind of see the, the chain of effect here as it goes. Nicotine. Nicotine is on the stimulants list, and it does have effects on sexuality. The great thing, well, nicotine, people smoke for all the reasons that people smoke. Um, it, it releases adrenaline upon ingestion, um, it can be a stimulant or a relaxer, depending on how much you consume. Um, what's good about cigarette smoking? Well, it's relaxing. It's a social drug. Um, it can make you feel like you're coping with anxiety. But the funny thing is that actually one of the effects of nicotine is that it actually increases anxiety. So it's kind of a strange circular thing. Um, what's bad about nicotine? Well, it smells. Um, it speeds up your general intestinal tract, a lot like coffee. Um, the long-term use is super problematic to pretty much everything in your body, um, as you probably know. Highly, highly linked with cancer. Um, and it, the effects that it has on sex, well, in terms of smell and taste, it can strongly affect the way that a person smells and tastes. So if you're the kind of person who's like, oh, I want to smell good, I want to taste good for my partner, um, nicotine isn't something that will help you do that. It will actually make you quite bitter. Um, and I mean, well, you may already be bitter. But, <laughs> you know what I mean. So if you want to smell and taste better, cut back on the smoking or stop the smoking. Another thing that smoking does is that um, it affects the cardiovascular system in a really interesting way, uh, corollary to sex, in that um, it leads to the hardening of blood vessels. And so over time, what this can do, and this is specifically related to talking about all of that erectile tissue that I mentioned earlier, um, it specifically affects the erectile tissues. So it does lead and, or is linked to in men. Keep that in mind. MDMA, um, Molly. It's a psychoactive amphetamine, as a lot of you know. What's great about it? What, why do people like to do it? Well, it's it's a highly tactile drug. It's a very pleasurable drug. It gives you an intense desire for contact with other people, and it makes you hypersensitive in a positive way. It increases your, your hypersensitiveness. Um, what's what's negative about it? Well. Poor partner choices. <laughs> your, your skills for assessing partners kind of goes out the window in a lot of ways. Um, upon stopping, a lot of users report depression and a drop in libido, and that's a wide, widely reported set of responses after stopping, especially for heavy users. Um, on, on, on Molly, sex can feel very melty and very floaty. Uh, a lot of people like this. 
Um, it can be very delightful, actually, but orgasm is often difficult, if not impossible, to reach for a lot of people. Um, it can be used in that way to delay orgasm, but a significant number of people also find it very frustrating that they can't quite reach the summit. Um, so, it can, uh, yes, it can also produce retarded ejaculation. That's definitely something you want to know. Um, and for some people, it intensifies orgasm. ADHD drugs, um, such as Adderall and Ritalin. So these drugs specifically um, address alertness, feeling focused. Um, they may per permit the taker to participate in sex for longer periods of time. Um, a side effect is inhibited orgasm. So again, it can be difficult, if not impossible, to reach the summit. Um, longer sex, again, promotes the risk of decreased lubrication um, and micro tears in the skin. Um, and again, um, quite a bit like methamphetamine and a bit like coke, um, people may take risks in order to achieve orgasm. Caffeine. Oh, I being fast, caffeine. Um, decongestants, I want to mention decongestants as well. Um, decongestants, people obviously take decongestants to decongest themselves. Um, but the, one of the acts of decongestants is working on mucous membranes, and what it does is it shrinks them and dries them out. Um, and this has the same effect on the sexual membranes. So people who take decongestants, especially regularly, will find that they will want to keep a bottle of lube around, a bottle of lube by the bed, for a variety of reasons. Um, it decreases lubrication in general. Um, also, decongestants can make you also smell and taste bitter as well. So if, again, something you're thinking about is smelling and tasting better for your partner, decongestants could be a culprit um, in trying to make yourself sweeter. Um, caffeine, it's it, an ergonomic aid. Um, it makes work feel less like work, which is why a lot of people really like it. Um, it's also highly addictive. Uh, caffeine's tolerance and dependence increase in tandem, just like heroin. Um, it's true. Um, what's great about it is that it makes you alert. Um, it also may uh, increase your ability to do athletic tasks. What's bad about caffeine, caffeine is insomnia, anxiety, headaches, high likelihood for physical, physical dependence, as we know. Um, withdrawal can last about a week, and that can be massively headachy, and <laughs> terrible, and make you very cranky. Um, and again, like I said, tolerance and independence build in tandem, and that tolerance builds really quickly with caffeine. Um, what does it do with sex? Well, aside from coffee dates, coffee dates are kind of an awesome side effect. Um, but the effect is pretty minimal, unless you're consuming really, really high doses of coffee. And by high doses, I mean eight or more cups a day. And if you're consuming eight or more cups a day of coffee, what it does to your sexuality is that it really makes you smell and taste like coffee. And <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and also, um, uh, heavy users, uh, heavy male users, like eight or more cups a day, it can actually uh, begin to produce what is called clotted ejaculate. And I think you know what that means. So, depressants. Depressants shut off shyness, um, they increase muscle relaxation, and they turn down your nervous system, so opposite. High correlations here to sexual dysfunction. And these are the guys I'm going to talk about. We're going to start with our BFF alcohol. Um, usually ingested orally, <laughs> can be taken anally. This is not a good idea. This is not a good idea. Do you know why it's not a good idea? Yes. It goes, yes, it goes, it's a much more direct route into the bloodstream. So any anything that someone, this, we're talking about people doing enemas with alcohol in them, um, or enema-like things. And what that does is it, it just, it pushes the alcohol directly into the bloodstream without all of the usual filters that it's supposed to go through or the way that it would go through. It's very, very harmful on your liver. It can increase the toxicity of alcohol and can increase your chances of alcohol poisoning. So, not a good idea. Um, incidentally, um, the act of putting alcohol and drugs in enemas is called booty bumping. <laughs> um, what's good about alcohol? Well, it lowers inhibitions. It's a very social drug. Um, it's, a, it's something that just relaxes people in general in small quantities. Um, in large quantities, or, and also bad side effects, um, it lowers inhibitions, which again can be good, but can also be bad. Um, mood changes, loss of coordination, and muscle control, including those needed for sexual function. 
So drunk sex is not always good sex. It's not always going to be productive sex. Um, in fact, alcohol is highly correlated with sexual dysfunction in general. So going out and getting drunk and getting laid, not going to be so great sometimes, most of the time. Um, especially if you get really, really drunk. You won't be able to get aroused the way that you normally get aroused. You won't be able to get aroused the way that you want to be aroused. Um, you may not be able to reach orgasm. There's a lot of different things along with the loss of muscle control and sloppiness that comes with it. Um, light use can make sex fun um, because it is an inhibition lower and it is a relaxant. Um, like I said, it interferes with erections because tissue engorgement. Um, it decreases sensitivity. It inhib inhibits orgasm. Um, and as we all know, it leads to poor impulse control when drunk. Um, and so it may, it may lead to things that you regret doing. One of the actions of alcohol is that it also blurs consent. And what do I mean by blurs consent? What I mean by blurs consent is that consent is unclear, or consent becomes unclear. Or people may say yes when they mean no. Or people may not may want to say no, but they may not know how to at the time because everything is fuzzy. Um, and that's, I think, probably part of why it's one of the biggest quote unquote date rape drugs, is because consent becomes something that is confused. And informed consent is something that completely goes out the window with things like drugs and sex and, and with alcohol. And informed consent, just in case you guys don't know, is essentially letting, it's, it's when you understand what you're consenting to and you have the ability to say yes or no. So if you're dealing with someone who doesn't know what they're saying yes or no to, and they may not have the ability to say yes or no, consent is blurred, consent is questionable. Um, and the way that you can get around this, around it, the way that you can deal with this is by obviously checking in with them. And you can check in with them in some fairly sexy ways, like saying, um, I would like to do this with you. What would you like to do? What would you like me to do? What would you like to do with me? asking them what they want to do. Because if you say, do you want to do this? They'll say yes or no. They won't say, I actually don't think I might want to do something else. That's When people are pressured and it's a sexual situation and they're interested in opportunities and the drunk and consent is blurred, it can be really, really easy to not say what you want. So another side effect of alcohol in males is decreased sperm count and also lowers testosterone. Testosterone is the, uh, is what makes you want to go fuck. FYI. Marijuana, pot. Um, what's great about it? Well, it's an analgesic, it's an anti-inflammatory, it's a sedative, it's an anti-convulsive, it's a laxative, and it's an appetite stimulant, which is why uh, a number of people who use, who are prescribed drugs for things like HIV, AIDS, um, those drugs tend to really, really kill your appetite, and so smoking pot can really help people um, in, in these instances. Um, what's bad about it? Well, it can increase your heart rate. Um, it can actually increase anxiety in some cases. Uh, it creates cognitive impairment um, and sensory distortions. What about with sex? Well, a little similar to Molly, it gives you melty floaty sex. Um, it can be highly tactile. The sex with pot can be somewhat childlike in some instances. It lowers your inhibitions, which can be really great for some people. Um, it does give you cotton mouth, which also means that you have dry orifices. Again, the usual cautions and dangers around not having enough lubrication are in place here. Long-term use leads to decreased testosterone, especially in males. Um, decreased testosterone production is a big contributor to moves, in case you don't know that, those are man moves. Um, <laughs> and it seriously interferes with sperm mobility, and this can last for months. So people who are interested in working on fertility are going to want to cut back or stop smoking pot for a couple of months. Um, I, I was trying to find some for the talk. I, I haven't been able to find them for a little while, but on YouTube, you used to be able to, to find, you could just Google stone sperm, and you would find uh, uh, microscope slides of comparisons between uh, heavy pot smokers' sperm and people who don't smoke pot, and the sperm were like, it's like when you smoke a lot of pot and you go into Safeway, and you like, can't remember why you went in there, and you're like, wandering around the aisles, and you're like, I think I want a snack. It, this, they're like that. They're just like lost, and they kind of they go over here, and they're like, oh yeah, let me go over here. And they kinda, mm -hmm. So that that kind of explains a lot, actually, about the decreased fertility part. Um, so yeah, heroin, heroin, heroin uh, is a central nervous system and autonomic nervous system uh, suppressant. It's a depressant. 
Uh, it affects the endocrine system. Uh, respiratory depression is a side effect. Um, it's a general intestinal tract antispasmodic, um, and it is ridiculously addictive, as a lot of us probably have heard. Um, what's good about heroin, or why do people do heroin? Because everything stops hurting. That is really the best way to describe the perspective of the heroin user and why they do it and why it's good for them. Everything stops hurting. The world stops hurting. What's bad about it? Oh, um, tolerance and dependence happen in tandem. Um, withdrawal is pretty much as bad as imaginable. Also, um, heroin addicts are horrible to hang around. Um, it's People who get highly addicted to heroin, as you probably know, will do pretty much anything to continue the habit. Um, everything will be sacrificed as a result in general. Um, there are such things as functional junkies, um, but they're still dealing with sort of the same uh, data set when trying to deal with life. Um, with sex, it can start out as a sex enhancement drug, but very, very quickly, all desire for sex is gone. Um, it is said to produce sleepy but highly tactile sex uh, in the short period that sex is good during heroin uh, use and addiction, um, but it quickly becomes an anti-sex drug. And then sex is really just only seen as desirable if it is a pathway to getting high quicker. Um, also, uh, with loss of libido, there's inhibited diminished orgasm, retarded ejaculation, um, and uh, like I said, uh, if it's not a quick pathway to getting high, users aren't interested. Most users see sex as a distraction from getting high. Um, and it can also <coughs> cause unpleasant spontaneous ejaculation. Tranquilizers, tranks, sedatives, anxiolytics, hypnotics. Uh, these include benzodiazepines, barbiturates, sedatives, anticonvulsants, hypnotics, and drugs that induce sleep. Uh, note, certain benzos classify as state rate drugs, like rupees and GHB. What's good about these? Well, no more anxiety. Um, especially great for people who are high anxiety and have benzodiazepines uh, prescribed to them or anxiolytics or hypnotics. Um, this can make life m much more functional for people. Um, so yes, no more anxiety. Um, they can decrease functional activity in general though. Uh, it does diminish, these do diminish irritability um, and they allay excitement. So this can be, as you can imagine, very helpful for some people. Um, also people who are too anxious to have sex, this may get them in a space where they are less anxious about having sex. Um, what's bad is that they may not put you to sleep, if that's what you're taking them for. Um, dependence and tolerance go in tandem. Withdrawal is bad. Um, the loss of inhibitions can be extreme with these drugs. Uh, there's cardiac and respiratory depression, uh, and combining tranquilizers can be deadly. So, Again, yeah, anxious people may be more interested in pursuing sex with these drugs, and that can be a positive side effect. Long-term use of these drugs, drugs can really fuck up your life. Um, it can, they can reduce your libido either quickly or gradually, um, and reduces your physical sexual response in general. Large doses can lead to sleep, inhibited orgasm, um, and combined with other depressants, create a date rape setting. Um, and I think that GHB is a good one to talk about in that context, but also other contexts. GHB is a, a close relative of GABA, that's gamma aminobutyric acid, your body's main inhibitory transmitter. It can be used as a sleep aid or a recreational intoxicant. It is usually consumed as a liquid. Um, what's good about GHB or why do people have an interest in taking GHB? It's brief. It lasts for about three or four hours. Um, it's typically considered a pleasant high that is similar to alcohol but without the hangover. Um, so people can do the whole, let's get drunk and rage, and then three or four hours later it's gone and there's no hangover. Um, there's a lack of anxiety. High doses can put you to sleep. Uh, again, it produces the intoxication without the hangover, which is what makes this attractive to some people. What's bad? Well, it can be a date rape drug. Uh, when combined with alcohol, you will almost certainly, almost certainly lose memory of the event. Um, one of the side effects also of DHB is that it increases uh, libido, it makes you horny. So when you combine the increased libido with alcohol and the drug and the lack of memory, you can understand what happens. Um, so that's that's the caution. Um, many users report that THB makes them horny, and so this is often when people will, will want to use this drug or use it in a target setting or a play setting. Um, some users report combined use with Molly. Um, 
reports moving past cuddling into fucking. So in, in thank you. In some cases, um, when we're dealing with clients, we'll, we'll encounter them combining the two quite a bit so that they can actually do the stuff and achieve the sex the way that they want to achieve the sex. Um, and that's, again, goes into all the other cautions with poor partner choices and things like that. Um, antipsychotics. Antipsychotics, specifically schizophrenia meds, like Thorazine, Haldol, Risperdal, and Clorazil. What these do is they control psychotic symptoms and delusional disorders and hallucinations. Um, sometimes they are prescribed to remove the sex drive completely. What's good about these? Well, they enable functioning in daily life for the people who need them. Uh, what's bad is gynecomastia, which is man boobs, um, and weight gain. And again, they're notorious the beta killers, which is the effect on sexuality. Although new generations of the medications um, don't kill the libido, but these are really, really hard to get, and they're very expensive at this time. And none of them have gone generic, unfortunately. So, I'll get through euphorians. I've got to give them the 10-minute sign. But um, these may combine stimulant, depressant, antipsychotic, and or hallucinogenic properties. And your mileage will definitely vary with these. So first, acid. Um, what's great about acid? <laughs> acid is a, a, a synthetic psychedelic drug that creates sensory distortions, <coughs> uh, hallucinations, mood alterations, and delusions. It can last 6 to 18 hours and can be good or bad. What's good about LSD? Hallucinations can be great. <laughs> uh, what's bad about LSD? Hallucinations can be terrible for some people. Um, with LSD, sex can be, sex has been reported as being highly, highly tactory or, or very sensory. Um, but it can be a very massive orgasmic inhibitor. So for some people, sex may be fun, but again, achieving orgasm or reaching the summit is probably going to be something that's out of reach. With mushrooms, it's very, very similar. Um, hallucinations, orgasmic inhibition, but possibly with vomiting. Um, and with mescaline, it's the same as well, but usually with vomiting. Um, ketamine, also special K. It's a veterinary tranquilizer. It's a disassociative anesthetic, like, much like nitrous. Um, that is usually injected but can be snorted or eaten. What's good about K? Pleasant separation of mind and body. This is what users report. Um, it blocks nerves, but it doesn't interfere with respiration or circulatory system. So it doesn't have the, uh, the depressants have the, the respiratory system depression, which can uh, lead to respiratory issues, respiratory problems, lung infections, and things like that. Um, ketamine doesn't have that side effect. Uh, what's bad? Nausea. Uh, many users become immobile or paralyzed but still awake. Um, and this, for many people, can be terrifying. Uh, sex, not much to report on sex uh, in this because sex is difficult to initiate on ketamine. Uh, as one of my colleagues said, sex is difficult to initiate in a cable. <laughs> Nitrous, another friend of ours. It's a mild anesthetic and it, it creates delirium and insensibility. And what's great about nitrous? It lasts all of about 20 seconds. What's bad about nitrous? It lasts all about 20 seconds. <laughs> um, it can intensify orgasm, but as you can imagine, this is difficult to time. <laughs> Poppers, not a big drug in this community, but a big drug in the community that I live in in San Francisco. Um, this, these include amyl, amyl butyl nitrate and helix. What these do is they produce a mild euphoria and smooth muscle dilation. We talked about smooth muscles earlier, uh, specifically the muscles in the anal sphincter. Um, and what this does is um, some of the smooth muscles that line the sphincter and, and the internal anal sphincter um, will relax. And so what this can do is this can lead to people being able to have anal sex easier or take larger objects if that's something that they're interested in. People want more fullness. This is a drug that they'll take to do that. Um, however, it does increase uh, or decrease your ability to be in touch with what's going on there, so it decreases a little bit of sensation. Um, so sex with this drug is something that will inform a fairly sophisticated form of consent and negotiation. Um, side effects include uh, vasodilation, a drop in blood pressure. And a drop in blood pressure means that these drugs can actually be deadly when combined with things like Viagra or people who are taking nitroglycerin for heart problems. Um, also, uh, Rush is a, another name for butyl nitrate. This is really, really bad for you. Um, it's sold as a VCR head cleaner, or it used to be. Um, yeah. Um, amyl nitrate is actually used in, a, uh, in, in ER settings um, for uh, angina, because the immediate drop in blood pressure will calm the system. Um, 
Yeah, combining it with Viagra will be dangerous and or deadly. Duster. Uh, what is duster? It's pressurized air that's used to clean, as you know, all the stuff that we use. Um, it's inhaled. It produces sedation, uh, psychomotor retardation, and passing out. And it fucks you up so badly. And what I mean by that is that it, it's, it causes um, brain damage. So it's not a very sexy drug, but it is, it is a drug that is used nonetheless. Um, I just wanted to include a couple of the uh, a couple drugs at the end here that were kind of interesting and used, um, but may not necessarily apply to this community. Um, Barbie or Brednotan, or uh, it's melatonin is the, the word that it was it was it's, it is what it was named when it first came out. Um, this is uh, this is a drug that is a silk road drug, and you can get it online. Um, its other name is Barbie. Um, it was developed as a sexual dysfunction drug originally, um, and it was discontinued because it raises blood pressure so very highly. Um, it is injected. Um, it is purchased with the points. Um, the interesting side effect of Barbie, and the reason that it's called Barbie, is that um, they realized in studies that it is actually a sunless tanning agent. So when you take it, you will get horny and tan. <laughs> it, is, it also contributes to weight loss. Um, this drug is popular in um, transgender communities uh, because it makes you lose weight, um, it makes you feel really horny and really, really good because sometimes the effects of taking different hormones can decrease the libido and that can be very frustrating for people in transition. Um, and also, uh, it makes you tan, so, and that makes people feel sexy sometimes. And that is that.
so you would cut this out of your talk, but um, you talk a little bit about, about um, hormones or you know, birth control or There's a lot actually to talk about there. Um, she's asking about hormones and how hormones can uh, correlate with sexual function. Yes. Um, so, uh, birth control pills uh, are often what we're talking about, uh, but we're also talking about implants. Um, and implants can be the implants that are in the arm or patch or IUD implants that can have hormones in them. Um, it's, they're, they're in different chemical cocktails, as you probably know. And some of these chemical cocktails are going to um, completely flatline your sex drive and make sex undesirable, not fun, something that you don't want, or it can increase. Um, it's really something that's tricky and you kind of have to shock a little bit. And what really sucks is that you end up becoming your own guinea pig and experimenting on yourself until you find the right combination that makes you feel okay. Um, because obviously there are other side effects as well that goes with taking hormones in different ways. Um, over, over amounts or increased amounts of estrogen in general um, will help decrease testosterone and so it can reduce desire in many ways. Um, it does increase your interest in being touched quite a bit. Um, over amounts of testosterone will make you just want to go fuck everything. So finding a good balance is, is, is helpful. Um, you are next. I'm not going to um, talk about the brands, um, and part of the reason I'm not going to talk about the brands is because I don't want to get any of the names wrong. So what I would, what I'll be happy to do though is, is I'll take all my notes. I have separate notes in here about antidepressants. I'll take my notes and I'll publish them online with my slides. And you'll, you should be able to get some information and some leads from there. I also can't specifically recommend any drugs, so <laughs> you can. <laughs> yes. What are some other good resources to find out more details, more factual information, like the kind that you've been presenting? It's very, very difficult to find information like this. Um, this talk is generally given. Okay, I have to stop now. Sorry. This talk is generally given in a clinical setting to people who are healthcare practitioners. This information is really, really valuable. I believe that it should be out there, and I believe that it should be shared because I believe it can reduce risk. But in terms of finding more research, it's very piecemeal. Um, a lot of people don't want to take the risk of talking about sex and drug use because they believe it may encourage people to do it. So, therefore, the risks. Thank you. Thank you so much.